Welcome to First Baptist Church of Turbyville. And oh, so I don't get the sign in the window. And uh, I hope y'all are having a great Sunday. I think I just muted it. Nope. I'll figure it out eventually. Almost four years of doing this, and I still can't get the electronics right. But uh, looks like everybody made it here, right? No? I like awkward, so we can stand up here until I get some interaction, some smiles, maybe, yeah, because it just seems like uh, people don't want to be here this morning. Thank you, Carrie Ann. See, we got one for the back, but, uh, oh yeah, time, yeah, it's only been two weeks, or a week. It's only been a week? Feels like eternity. Anyway, thank you all so much for being here, and let's go ahead and open up with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for this opportunity, God, to worship you. We thank you for this opportunity to be amongst fellow believers. God, if there's anyone here this morning that does not know you, just pray that uh, the Spirit moves and that they come to know you this morning. Now, be with us as we praise you, God, and as we dig into your word and as we spend time with the children and just as we go about doing what you called us to do. And so, God, just be with us again. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, so the first song is 393, The Family of God. If you will stand and sing 393, The Family of God. We're just going to sing it one time this morning. to sing that like three times. So at this, <laughs> at this time, I'd like to ask Cousin Sydney to come forward, all the children for children's time, as uh, we find out what Cousin Sydney's got in store for you this morning. I got candy. Hi. Oh, you got something cool there. Guess what, guys? I have... More spring jokes for you. Yeah! <laughs> I think these are excellent myself. Okay. All right. I'll start with this one. What do you get when you push a bunch of Easter eggs down a hill? Um, you don't get Easter eggs. Don't get Easter eggs. That's actually a really good answer, but that's not. Spring rolls. <laughs> okay all right listen to this one a flat we're talking about spring right flowers okay what is a flower's favorite kind of pickle what is a flower's favorite kind of pickle oh um seed flowers that's Daffo pretty good. A daffo dill. <laughs> what? Okay, I think you'll like this one then. Tyler really liked this one, okay? What do you get, all right, when you find a bear in the middle of a spring shower? Um, you pull him out. out. You pull him out in a the spring. Oven. What do you, what do you get when you find a bear in the middle of a spring shower? A drizzly bear. <laughs> These are great. Okay. All right. We're talking about spring. Last week I showed y'all a cool little piece of thing, and it was we were talking about new life, right, when everything's blooming, you know? Did you know... That creation, okay, worships God. Uh, yes. You do know that? It's in Psalms. Did you know that? Let me tell y'all. Creation worships God. It's in Psalm 
chapter 148. Did you hear that? Psalm 148. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise Him in the sight. All right, listen to this. Praise Him, sun and moon. Yep, it says it, sun and moon. Praise Him. Praise Him, all you shining stars. Praise Him, you highest heavens and you waters above the heavens. Isn't that cool? Praise the Lord from the earth, you great sea creatures and all deeps. Okay, listen to this. We were talking about spring and blooming it, right? Listen to this. Mountains and all hills, fruit trees and all cedars. I wanted to give you an example this morning of how a tree can worship God. Let me show it to you. Now, y'all y'all stay seated, okay? Look at this. Flower. It's a flower. How many petals are on it? How many of these? Four. What is it? Look at it very close. Listen to me. Look, look at it really close. It looks like the shape of something. It looks like a cross, it doesn't cross. it? Look at the ends of it. Does they look like there's holes in it, don't it? Yeah, from Jesus, because uh, they put the, uh, the thing on the end. Look at the back of where the holes are at. If you hold it up, you see a different color there. What's the color? Wow. It looks brown. It looks red, doesn't it? Do you think that could be important? Jesus' blood right where the holes are at. Look at the color of the petals. What are they? White. White normally kind of means purity. Was Jesus pure? Yes. He was pure from what? Sin. And look in the middle. Look at it. Yellow. It looks kind of like a crown of thorns, don't it? You want to see it? It has pollen. I picked this off of a dogwood tree this morning to show you guys, Whoa. to prove it to you that even trees worship God. Isn't that cool? It looks like a cross. There's no other tree like the dogwood tree. And it blooms petals in the spring that looks like a cross. That gives, because of the cross, we can have new life in him isn't that cool yeah yeah that's pretty cool isn't it so the bible is true when it says all creation can praise god how much more should we if a tree can do it you can do it too can't you easter's coming up isn't that cool have you ever thought about it like that before it's true. I'm holding it right in front of you. Let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you so much that the reality that all creation is constantly praising you, maybe in ways that we don't realize it, and we're living in the truth of the word every day, and how much more should we live in that reality to praise you all the time for your work for us? And Lord, I pray that we would teach these to these kids as well, be an example of that. And I ask, like Uncle Mike says, that you would bring us more. In your name I pray, amen. I got you, kiddies. Oh, oh, oh. There you go. You know what? Y'all can get two a piece. Here you go. All right. <laughs> yep, two pieces. There you go. I got a lot that need to be getting rid of. Here you go. Here, you want one more? There you go. There you go. So, now, if everyone will stand, and we'll be singing 392, we're marching to Zion. 392, we're marching to Zion. All four verses.
so would like me to read this to the church from his family. Late night phone calls are the ones you are scared to answer for fear of the news that's at the other end. Three weeks ago, that call came. Mama, Caleb has been burned. It's bad. I will call you back as soon as I know more. Pray, just pray. So that's what we did along with so many more family members and dear friends. To make a long story short, Caleb is on the mend. His face is healing nicely. His hands will take a little longer, but are so much better than they could have been. Thank you for all the calls, visits, and gifts. Our children have been overwhelmed by the outpouring of love and support that has been shown to them. The next time you feel that you are at a loss for what to do for someone, just remember the words that Shana said to me. Pray, just pray, it works. Yours in Christ, the Coker, Beasley, and Gibbons family. So thank you um, for that awesome thank you note. Um, <clears throat> since we're talking about Caleb, he's doing better. Um, got a shot the other day for infection. Um, hopefully we'll be going back to school soon. Um, so just continue to pray for him and the family as he is continuing to heal. So Annie Armstrong, as we're doing our <clears throat> church goal, we were at needing 1,200 still. We received 290 this morning. I'm not going to do public math, but unofficially, we need a little less than $1,000. All right, is what we have left. So um, we received 290. We needed 1,200 as of Wednesday. That was the official call or the official count. So we need a little less than $1,000 to meet our goal of $4,000. So thank you to all who have given and continue to give. Um, we will have our Easter egg hunt Sunday, Sunday <clears throat> April 2nd during Awana. Um, if you would like to bring candy, you can. We have candy back here, um, but we have a lot of one kind. So if you don't, that's fine. We got candy. But if you feel led to bring some candy to be put in eggs for that Easter egg hunt, feel free to do so. I'm not going to stop anyone that wants to do that. Um, we have some upcoming events. On April 4th is Men's Fellowship at 7, uh, the 9th. Is Easter Sunday. There will be a communion and no evening service. Uh, the 11th is the Dicey Gibbon Circle. This is all in April at 530. 13th through 15th is the Pudding Swamp Festival. And the 18th is the Deacons Meeting. And the 19th is our business meeting. Um, there will be a couple of committees meeting on Wednesday. The nominating committee will meet Wednesday at 545 uh, right here at the church. And then the finance committee will meet immediately after at 6.15. So if you uh, are on those committees, please be here. If you cannot be here, contact Thomas. He's the one that uh, told me about him. Um, he is out watching somebody sing at New Spring in Florence this morning. So, uh, But nominate committee Wednesday at 5.45, finance at 6.15 on Wednesday. We had a few birthdays last week. Uh, Hayden's was last Sunday. We talked about that. Melba's was Tuesday, along with Olivia Floyd. We already harassed Melba Wednesday, so I won't do it now. Rebecca Smith was on the 16th, and that's it. But then we got a real superstar on Friday. Hazel, you got something coming up? You don't know? All right. Kenneth better know. He better remember. But uh, if you see those folks, please wish them a happy Happy birthday. Before I move on to prayer, is there anything I'm missing? Any last-minute announcements? All right. So, uh, folks, we need to pray for on top of um, our normal prayer list. Uh, Felicia, she's been dealing with a, a fever the last couple of days. We think it's just allergies. Um, but she realized this morning that her biannual bout with breathing issues never came. She's been a year with without having bronchitis or anything like that. So just pray for her that she's not getting bronchitis and all that. Um, pray for Tommy Nixon. Uh, he's having open heart surgery on Wednesday. Um, Pete is having a heart cath tomorrow, so please pray for him and Myra. Um, continue to pray for those that have lost loved ones. We've got quite a few that have been dealing with um, death recently. Uh, continue to pray for Caleb. Uh, we have a couple of praises. Um, I got a text from Amanda Thigpen. Grayson went to Winter Jam on the 11th of March. I think that one was in Greenville. 
Um, but anyway, he got saved. So that is awesome. And she said he is on fire for God. So if you know that young man or live near him or want to swing by, uh, just encourage him as he's going through this um, change in his life, this good change. But uh, Grayson Thigpen was saved on 11 uh, March. And then uh, good news, uh, praise for Ed Snyder. I remember I mentioned him. Uh, he's one of Austin's coaching friend's dad. Well, the cancer he's dealing with, the doctors can control it. So it's something he will die with, not from. So, uh, But continue to pray for him as he's going through chemo and all that other stuff. But um, that's another uh, praise as well. Any other prayer requests? Yes, ma'am. Okay. What's her name? Patricia Land? Lynn? Uh, I'll get her added. As soon as I find the pen that I had up here. Patricia Lynn. All right. Headaches. Any others? Amen. That's awesome. I'm glad. It says a lot being married to Freddie. No comment? No. Nah, that is a huge praise. Carol got a good report from her heart, Doc. Any others? All right. At this time, I'd like to ask our deacon chair, Austin, to come forward. The altar is open. You can come pray at the altar. You can pray right where you're at as we uh, have our deacon prayer time. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for another opportunity to um, come and, and bring prayers and praises to you. Um, and not, to not forget the power of prayer and the importance of prayer. Lord, we do pray for our sick and healing this morning. Um, some of them have gotten good news and are, and are on the mend, and, and some of them are not. Um, and some of them are seeking answers. Uh, Pray for the doctors and nurses that are taking care of them and that you'll watch over them and be with the family members um, who are beside them. Lord, we also want to be mindful not to forget those um, who have lost loved ones recently um, and knowing that that, that grief and, and the process of losing someone does not stop after the funeral and the days after, um, that we'll continue to um, be used by you to uh, witness to them and to offer comfort. Um, and knowing that the ultimate comfort is you. Lord, as we near Easter, we, we just pray that um, we don't get lost in everything that surrounds the holiday um, that isn't the miracles uh, that we see performed um, in and around those days. Um, Lord, please continue to be with this church and uh, help us just be a vessel for your kingdom, Lord. And we pray this morning, especially for our pastor and the sermon that he brings us, um, that we'll be receptive to it and that um, that he'll bring the word that you've laid upon his heart. Lord, again, be with us as we go from here. We pray these things in your name. Amen. All right. For our offertory hymn, you may remain seated. We're going to sing 332, Breathe on Me. Or breath on me? Melba picks one, I don't know. We'll see how this goes. 332, Offertory Hymn.
All right. Again, welcome. Is it hot in here? No. Let me see. I'll ch- I'll check. Nope. Sixty nine. This this side should be all right. Well, I'll be quick. Not really. Maybe today I'll go two and a half hours. Did you bring water? Oh, that's true. I mean, fair enough. You can. Um, but welcome again uh, to First Baptist Church of Turbyville. It's such an honor and a privilege to be here with you all again this morning. So this morning, if you have your Bibles, if you'll take and turn to Judges chapter 7. Judges chapter 7. Now, I told you a long time ago that I'm not a big fan or I'm not very good at labeling sermon titles. Uh, So this one is letting go and let God, right? Which is something that is very difficult, I know, for me to do. It is very difficult for me to do. I need to make sure that I have everything planned, everything's in a row, I've got enough of this, I've got enough of that. Whatever it is, if I'm going to do it, I want to make sure that it's going to be successful. My greatest fear in this world is failure. And I think that's a lot of folks' greatest fear is failure. If you really get down to it, we're all afraid of failing, especially when we've been called, maybe asked to do something, right? We want to have the tools, we want to have the equipment, we want to have the proper um, items needed to be successful. Well, in Judges chapter 7, we get to see Gideon, who has all those things. He's got 32,000 men, 32,000 men to take out the Midianites, who had been oppressing Israel. Now, if you go to the previous chapter, we see where Gideon is called, or the previous few chapters, Gideon is called, Gideon destroys the altar of Baal, but here's what I like about Gideon. Gideon wanted to make sure that God was really calling him. Gideon wanted to make sure because Gideon got multiple signs from God. Gideon requested signs from God. God. He wanted to make sure not only that he had the proper equipment, but that he was the right man for the job. And God showed him that he was, because if you see, if you if you go back a chapter, God doesn't get upset with Gideon. God gives Gideon the signs. God gives him the reassurance, which the reason I'm talking about the previous chapters, because it leads up to this because Gideon's got 32,000 strong. I'm going to go take care of this for you, God. You called me to do it. And God says, oh, no, Gideon, you got too many people. You've got too many people. I'm going to give you this victory. And we know that God does give him the victory, but it's not because of anything Gideon did. It's not because of anything that the 3,000 men that ended up going in to fight or going in to do what God commanded them to do. It wasn't because of any of them. It was because of God. It was because of God. And it was because Gideon had the faith to let go and let God. So we're going to pick up in Judges chapter 7 in verse 1. And we're going to read through 18. We could do the whole um, uh, chapter, but I decided to cut it off at 18. So starting in verse 1. Then Jeroboam that is Gideon, and all the people who were with him rose early and encamped beside the spring of Herod, and the camp of Midian was north of them by the hill of Morah in the valley. The Lord said to Gideon, The people with you are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hand, lest Israel boast over me, saying, My own hands have saved me. Now therefore proclaim in the ears of the people, saying, Whoever is fearful and trembling, let him return home and hurry away from the mount or from Mount Gilead. Then 22,000 of the people returned, and 10,000 remained. And the Lord said to Gideon, The people are still too many. Take them down to the water, and I will test them for you there. And any one of whom I say to you, This one shall go with you, shall go with you. And any one of whom I say to you, This one shall not go with you, shall not go. So he brought the people down to the water, and the Lord said to Gideon, Everyone who laps the water with his tongue as a dog laps, you shall set by himself. Likewise, everyone who kneels down to drink, 
And the number of those who lapped, putting their hands to their mouth, was 300 men. But all the rest of the people knelt down to drink water. And the Lord said to Gideon, with the 300 men who lapped, I will save you and give the Midianites into your hand. And let all the others go, every man to his home. So the people took provisions in their hands and their trumpets, and he sent all the rest of Israel, every man to his tent, but retained the 300 men, and the camp of Midian was below him in the valley. The same night the Lord said to him, Arise, go down against the camp, for I have given it into your hand. But if you are afraid to go down, go down to the camp with Pura, your servant, and you shall hear what they say, and afterward your hand shall be strengthened to go down against the camp. Then he went down with Pura, his servant, to the outpost of the armed men who were in the camp. And the Midianites and the Amalekites and all the people of the east lay along the valley like locusts in abundance, and their camels were without number as the sand that is on the seashore in abundance. When Gideon came, behold, a man was telling a dream to his comrade. And he said, Behold, I dreamed a dream, and behold, a cake of barley bread tumbled into the camp of Midian and came to the tent and struck it so that it fell and turned it upside down so that the tent lay flat. And his comrade answered, This is no other than the sword of Gideon, the son of Joash, a man of Israel. God has given into his hand Midian and all the camp. As soon as Gideon heard the telling of the dream and its interpretation, he worshipped and he returned to the camp of Israel and said, Arise, for the Lord has given the host of Midian into your hand. And he divided 300 men into three companies and put trumpets in the hands of all of them and empty jars with torches inside the jars. And he said to them, Look at me and do likewise. When I come to the outskirts of the camp, do as I do. When I blow the trumpet, I and all who are with me then blow the trumpets also on every side of all the camp, and shout for the Lord and for Gideon. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for this real-life story of how it's about you and it's always been about you. And when we make it about you, we will always be successful. We may not see it as successful in the sense of we think of success, God, but it is always successful to you. There is always a plan that is being executed. So God, just help us to understand, help us to seek you, help us to to open our hearts and our minds and to listen to your still small voice. And be with us as we go through the rest of the service. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, so as I said before, we see Gideon, he's got 32,000 men, and God gets him down to three Now, you see that when he goes down to this camp, how many enemy are down there? There's a lot because it says the camels can't even be numbered. So for each one of those camels, there's probably a human attached to it, right? So we know that between the Midian and the Amalekites, it is a lot of people that they are going up against, Now, what Gideon is teaching us, the first thing that we can pull out of this is that God is going to test our faith. God is going to test our faith. If we are Christ followers this morning, our faith is going to be tested. Our faith is going to be tested. I don't know about you, but my faith is tested rather frequently. A lot of it has to do with because of my way my brain is wired. I'm constantly, uh, sometimes a little too skeptical about why things are the way they are or why somebody's doing something that they're doing. Or, But my faith gets tested. If your faith doesn't get tested, my hats are off to you, and I would love to have a conversation with you to find out exactly what it is you do from the time you get up to you go to bed to where your faith is never tested. But God is going to test our faith, and we see this in the story of Gideon. Because remember, he's got 30 2,000 men. He really doesn't have to have a lot of faith, right? He's got the manpower. His faith isn't in God at this point. His faith is in those 32,000 men. And his faith may even be in the fact that God called him to do it because God showed him multiple times that he was the man. So we could see how Gideon maybe in, in these 32,000 men could say that if they went in and they, they took victory, if they, they did what God told them to do, that it was because of the number. 
It was because of them, not God. So God wanted to make sure that with beyond a shadow of a doubt that it was only because of God that Gideon was able to conquer their enemies. And so we see the first thing that God does. He says, all right, Gideon, you got too many. You've got too many. I want you to go and I want you to stand up and say, if you are afraid, you can go. How many people left? 22,000. 22,000 said, yep, I'm afraid. I'll see you later, Gideon. Good luck with whatever God's got you doing over here. I don't know about you, but if I was Gideon and I watched 22,000 people leave, I'd be a little shook. I'd be asking God, what is going on? I know you said that you want to make sure that it's about you, and it's all about you. But how am I going to defeat these, these, these enemy that, that their camel is, is just out in numerous, or, or, or however you say that word. I'm not going to try and say it again. But they got so many camels, you can't even number them. And now I'm left with 10,000? Because you asked me to tell folks, or you told me to tell folks, hey, if you're scared, go home. And sure enough, 22,000 of them were scared, and they went home. Now, I want you to think real quick before we move on, the blessing that they missed out on because of their fear. Because they didn't realize that the God that they serve is a God not of fear. He doesn't give you the spirit of fear. It says it in the New Testament. But I want to think about those 22,000. We got another 7,000. We got to whittle down to still. But remember, God is testing Gideon's faith. God is testing Gideon's faith. So the next thing he does, he says, all right, I want you to take the rest of the men. It's still too many, 10,000. It's not da- whittled down enough uh, for my comfort. It's not whittled down enough uh, for um, what I think it should be. So I want you to take them to this, this river, and I want you to, to watch them. And if they kneel down, uh, I want you to separate them and put them off on their own. And if they lap it up like a dog, I want you to put them off on their own. Well, what do we see? We see that 300 of them lap it up like a dog. 7,000 of them kneel. So God tells Gideon, all right, let the 7,000 go home. That 300 that lapped up like a dog, that's what you've got. Now, I want you to understand as we go and progress through the story, God is testing Gideon. I want you to see that God doesn't just say, trust me, without giving him some proof. God doesn't just say, I'm going to test you. And I'm not going to give you any proof because we see that later on in this text, what does he tell him? He says, all right, I've given up. You've got the 300 men. It's to my glory. Go and do it. But if you're still not comfortable, I want you to take your servant, go down to the camp and listen. See, when God tests our faith, he's not going to do it without reassurance. He's not going to do it without reassurance. He reassured Gideon how many times? One, when God, when he was like, God, are you sure you're calling me? Are you sure that I'm your guy? God gave him signs. See, many a times we say, well, God doesn't give me signs. God doesn't speak to me. When was the last time you sat down and actually listened? That's where I fail. When was the last time you actually sat down, I actually sat down in a quiet room and just meditated on him and his word? I'm not talking about if you've got an hour a day set aside. I'm talking about where you just find a quiet place. I don't care if it's a closet, and you just sit down. You can have your eyes open. You can have them closed. But it's quiet, and you're listening for that still, small voice see because while God is testing you he's still talking to you he's still giving you reassurance because he never leaves you out there on your own I will never leave you nor forsake you even when your faith is being tested isn't it through those tests that you're we become stronger when we have to rely on God To get things done, we grow stronger in our relationship with him and our reliance on him. See, that's what the testing of our faith is all about. That's what the testing of Gideon's faith was all about, was showing the children of Israel that they needed God. He didn't need them. If he needed them, he'd have had all 32,000 go in there and take down their enemies. 
But just because our faith is getting tested, just because our faith gets tested doesn't mean that we're on our own. God doesn't say, here, I'm going to test your faith, and then I'm going to let you out. I believe it was the Spartans that when a kid, uh, a young male became of age, they would kick him out of camp and they had to survive. And if they didn't survive, they died. If they came back to camp after so many days, then they were men and they were warriors. That's not what God does. God has unconditional love for us. God wants us to have the strongest faith possible. But sometimes to get there, we have to go through some things. We have to have our faith tested. And then if you go from verses 9 through about 15a, we see that God will encourage our faith. God not only tests our faith, but he also encourages our faith. And this is what the story I was talking about. That same night, verse 9, as the Lord said to him, Arise, go down against the camp, for I have given it into your hand. But if you are afraid to go down, go down to the camp with Pura, your servant. See, God didn't just want Gideon to go down there. God wanted Gideon to learn something through this testing of his faith. God is sovereign. God is always in control. God is in charge. So we see Gideon, he goes, all right, you're giving me an opportunity to go down here and get some reassurance. I'm going to take it. So he takes his servant, Pura, and he goes down to the camp. And then what does he hear? He hears somebody talking about a dream, about some bread, the manna that rolled down and took out a tent, flipped it upside down, destroyed it. What was the answer to that dream? That Gideon was coming and he's got God on his side. See, God will always encourage our faith, even when our faith is being tested. See, having our faith tested, I want to make sure, I don't want to go back, but I want to make sure we understand that's not necessarily a bad thing. That is not a bad thing. It's a part of being a Christ follower. But see, while our faith is being tested, we are encouraged. God will encourage us us again as i said when was the last time instead of putting a time on it which is my problem you know when was the last time i actually thought you know what i'm just going to go into my closet and i'm going to be in there until you tell me i'm done i can tell you it's been a while i can tell you it's been a while i'd be lying to you if i said i i did that constantly but we know how life is We know how we can start getting wrapped up in things, and we start thinking about things, and, you know, kids are screaming. Well, some of us know about that. Um, Kids are screaming, slamming doors, hollering, fighting. But to hear God and to be encouraged by God, we have to spend time with him. I mean, how do you get encouraged by someone that you don't even talk to? How do you be encouraged by someone that you don't even read about? You know, there's tons of folks on this earth, and I'm sure some of you have heard about her. Uh, She was a young lady that got her arm bit off by a shark. She was a surfer. I forgot her name. They did a movie about her. She's uh, a Christian. Bethany Hamilton, thank you. Well, if I don't know her story, if I didn't watch the movie, if I didn't read articles, if I, I'm sure there's a book out, I didn't read it, but if I didn't know about her, how can I be encouraged by what she's sharing? I can't. And it's the same thing when we talk about God and God being the encourager of our faith, the perfecter, not only the encourager, but the perfecter of our faith. We can't be encouraged if we don't know anything about him. We can't be encouraged if we don't spend time with him. We can't be encouraged if we're not listening to him. See, Gideon gives us a great example of what it looks like to listen to God. And not only that, but Gideon took every opportunity God gave him. Gideon took every opportunity God gave him. God said, you know what? I've delivered the Midianites into your hand, but if you don't feel comfortable yet, go down there and and sit and listen outside the camp. Gideon said, yes, sir, I will do that. I will take you up on that. See, God wants us, as he's encouraging our faith, God wants us to take him up on his promises. God wants us to take him up on his offers. 
That's why the Bible is full of truths. That's why the Bible is full of promises. But the Bible, much like our brain, we probably use only about 10% of it. When there's 100% there for the taking. All we have to do is listen. All we have to do is spend God, time with God. So God will test our faith. God will not only test our faith, but he will encourage our faith. And then God will honor our faith. God will honor our faith. I want you to think about the, the, the missionaries and, and, and the folks that have said, yes, God, I will do what you want me to do. I'm sure everybody here has heard the story of the family that went to New Guinea. They were killed. Um, the five missionaries were killed by, some, uh, cannibalist, by a cannibalistic tribe. You all heard this story? Um, they flew in. They were killed. Well, did you know? I, okay, let me back it up. Let me, let me kind of set the stage for you. I don't know about you, but if my father was killed by somebody, I probably really don't care where their soul goes when they die. If we're being honest. Now, should I care? Yes. But if I'm standing here being honest, just thinking about it, it's never happened to me, praise God. But if somebody kills my father who's trying to do something to help them, it's going to be hard for me to care where their soul goes when they die. Did you know that his family, the family of the slain missionaries, is still in that region. Matter of fact, one of their helpers, one of the guys who does a lot of the speaking for them, was one of the murderers on that beachhead. See, that's the types of things, that's the type of um, honor that we get from God when we keep the faith in spite of the tests, in spite of the difficulties that tribe no longer eats people. That tribe is now considered a Christian tribe. They're reaching out to other tribes in their area. I read a book on them, and I usually can remember their name, but I can't this morning. Maybe some of you know them. But you can go online and research this whole thing. They fly in and out. The same people that murdered the missionaries are now bringing others to Christ. You think God isn't honoring their faith? That family's faith? That hung around? Because I can only imagine the questions on the, the parents' mind, especially the kids as they grew up. Why, God? You called us here. Why did you allow my husband, why did you allow my father to die at the hands of the people you called us to bring to you? You think that didn't test some faith? I bet it did. But God also encouraged them during that time, and God has honored their faith. What we see with Gideon, he heard the dream. So after he heard the dream and its interpretation, it says he worshiped in verse 15. He worshiped. Then he returned to the camp of Israel and said, Arise, for the Lord has given the host of Midian into your hand. And then he comes up with a plan, divides them up. They all have their trumpets. They all have the glass uh, mason jars with torches in them. And then if you read the rest of the chapter, there's a big old thing that they do where they blow the trumpets, slam the fire, the, the glass, cause a whole bunch of noise, scream out that it's for um, God and for, for the Lord and for Gideon. And then guess what? The people fled. The people fled. So we see just in this short story how God tested Gideon's faith. So then the question is this morning, how is God testing your faith? How has God tested your faith? Maybe you're just not in a season where God is testing your faith, but how has God tested your faith? And how did you respond? Was it like Gideon where you listened to God? You didn't, you didn't sit back and say, well, God, that's crazy. I don't, I don't think that's really you telling me to do that. Or did you answer like Gideon and take God up on every offer? Remembering his promises that he gives us in the word. Did you listen and, and hear some encouragement during that time of testing? 
Or are you like me, you just put your head down and went like a bull in a china closet. And then when you came up for air, you realized, well, God wanted me to do that, just not that way. And then finally, we're promised, we're shown that God will honor our faith. God honored Gideon's faith by defeating the enemy. See, because none of us are outside of being tested. If you are a Christ follower here this morning, you are not outside the realm of being tested. Your faith will be tested. Just look at what's going on in the world today. How easy is it to be a Christ follower out there today? Not very easy. If you live in Canada, you go to jail, which is just on the northern border. Not too far from good old America. I read a story. There's a NHL goalie and San Jose Sharks are going to do an LGBTQ night. And he refuses because of his faith to dress up that night. Now, if you remember, there was another hockey player that did that. And they called for him to be fired, which means take away any of his money that he makes. He no longer can take care of his family. Does any of this sound familiar when you read in the book of Revelations? It's not easy to be a Christ follower out there today. It's not easy to follow what God tells us to. But here's what I'll tell you. What I do like about this, um, the San Jose uh, Sharks goalie, is he said, like Jesus Christ, I love everyone. I love everyone. But my faith does not allow me to celebrate sin. See, and that's how, that's how we can live, and that was just a little side note that I wanted to share. But our faith is going to be tested. It probably already has multiple times. But know that God will encourage you during that testing. You are not alone. There's some of you here this morning that feel like you're alone right now, and you're sitting in a sanctuary with your brothers and sisters. But you're not alone. Not only do you have God, but you're supposed to have one another. And the most difficult thing for us to understand and for us to to mentally see, and maybe for us to uh, realize, is that it's going to be okay. At the end of it all, God will honor our faith. God will honor anything that honors him. See, if it's about God, it doesn't matter how rough it is. In the end, it's going to work out. It's going to be okay. And you know what? I'll tell you this morning, the end may be when you're dead and in heaven. That might be the reality of it. Or maybe the rapture happens. That might be the reality of your end. But know that if that is your end, it's still better. And it's still far greater than anything you're dealing with now in anything you will deal with in the future. See, through Gideon and through those 300 men, God showed his strength. He didn't show the strength of men. He showed his strength. God showed his love for his people. And if you're a Christ follower here this morning, you are his people. You are his children. And so no matter what your fight is this morning, God is with you. You are not alone. Keep the faith and know that God will honor that. That God will honor that. We don't serve a dead God, much like sometimes we like to act. God is alive. Jesus is in heaven sitting at the right hand of the Father. Alive waiting to come back and take care of the problem of evil and sin once and for all. See, it all works out. We just have to be prepared. We just have to remember that there's going to be testing of the faith. God will encourage us. And that if we remain steadfast, and the New Testament talks about this a lot, if we remain till the end, God will honor. Much like Paul says, 
Well done, now good and faithful servant. That's what he wanted to hear from God when his time was over. We should want to hear the same thing. We should want to hear the same thing. So as the musicians come, if, if you're dealing with anything this morning, if you feel like your t- faith is being tested, come up here and have a conversation with God or have a conversation right where you're at or go home and get into a place that's quiet. Have a conversation with God and he will encourage you. You are not alone. He will honor you. He will honor your faith. As the musicians play, the altar is open. Thank you all so much for being here this morning. Reminder tonight, 5.30, Awana. So if you got little kids running around, have them here at 5.30 for Awana at 6 o'clock, regular Sunday evening worship. We're going to end today's service just a little bit different. Our brother Martin is uh, struggling right now. He's got a lot of health issues going on. So what I would like is anyone that feels comfortable, go to where he's at. We're going to lay hands on him and pray. If you don't want to get up, just pray in his direction. You put hands out, whatever you feel comfortable with. But if you all will join me, that will join me and lay hands on Martin. We'd like to pray over him. Father God, we just lift up Martin Hudson, God. Is You know everything that he's dealing with, God. You know the feeling of just can't catch a break with is just one thing after another, God. I just pray 
that as he goes through these things, that you just give him the strength. God, give him the peace to know that it's not easy, but he's got you. God, help the doctors to, to figure something out, God, to just guide them, lead them, guide the specialist, God, just to give Martin and Melba some answers, God, of what's going on. God, we know that you're still in the miracle work in business. And so, God, we are praying for a miracle here this morning, God, that you just help Martin, heal him, get him back to where he can walk without falling over, God, where he is stable on his feet. God, help them to figure out a better way to do the dialysis, God, the it's just draining the hours that he sits on that machine. God, we know that ultimately your will is going to be done. We just pray that as the almighty physician, God, as the almighty healer, as the miracle worker that you are, that you just bring a miracle to Martin and Melba. God, we ask all these things in your most precious and holy name. Amen.